Psychology Conference chaired by the Department of Emergency Medicine with the topic to tap or not to tap. I am Hello, I am Evelyn, your moderator for today. Today in particular, I would like to express my gratitude and warm welcome to our plenary and featured speakers, Dr. Hamad Hamdi Che Hassan and Dr. Bea Buncho from Cardiology Unit, Dr. Muhammad Ishamuddin Ismail from Cardiothoracic Unit, Dr. Muhammad Isaac Arslan from Radiology, and last but not least, Dr. Chai Kim Chong from our ED department. It is our pleasure to have you here to share our to share your clinical expertise. Before we start, I would like to remind all of you to silence your phone. Due to the constraint, due to time constraint, please reserve your questions during the Q and A session at the end of all presentations. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Chai Kim Chong. He is a second year nurse student in the emergency department. He will present to us the case presentation to tap or not to tap. The floor is yours, Dr. Chai. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, our consultants, specialists, uh, senior colleagues, and students on the floor. So, uh, my name is Chai. So, today we are talking about this case. Uh, actually, I'm going to present one case to tap or not to tap. So, by just looking at the topic, I think there are only a few conditions right, that you can think of that can allow us to tap or not to tap, right? So, we continue first. So we have a 84 years old old lady. She actually has an underlying myeloproliferative neoplasm, arthritis, hypertension, DM, CKD. So these are the medications she is on, and basically it's a polypharmacy. And then this lady particularly came on this day to yellow zone initially with the presentation of chesty cough for four days, difficult to breathe, four days also, and fever. She's tachycardic, tachycardic, hypoxic under room air, so she was initially put on face mask. Uh, the temperature documented was 36.5 and she's still conscious. And from the physical examination, lungs, there's actually generalized reduced NC with some wrong chyme, abdomen, hepatomegaly, and serious muscle heart sound. And you can see the pseudo edema. So at this point of time, I think there can be a few differential diagnosis that can possibly run through your mind. I think by just looking at this, you may think of, okay, this patient may have food overload, mm, maybe decom CCF, maybe decom liver failure, but uh, because there's a history of fever, so maybe patient also having pneumonia, right? And I think the most relevant to our topic today is muscle heart sound. So, okay, we carry on. So, the positional diagnosis initially, we are thinking of pericardial effusion, pneumonia, or even pericarditis, or PE. So, this is the initial chest x ray where you can see there's a globular heart, cardiomegaly. The left cortical angle is a bit blunted, and there's some tactile resonance over the right middle zone. And from the ECG, what you can see here is the sinus tachycardia, um, low voltage. Uh, what I mean by low voltage is you can see generous amplitude over the limit, one, two, three, or five milliliter, less than five milliliter, if you can see, right, less than one small box. And we actually cut out our cortisol, and you can see the total vision is there. At that point of time, initially in the yellow zone, the right atrium and ventricle not collapse. Okay, and yes, there's minimal fluid fusion, as noted in the chest x ray. As now, so the ABG initially is a type 1 vessel failure, right? Okay, and this is the type investigation, and we can see heart cell is raised, CRP also raised, the slight worsening of the urea crack. The person is normal, liver function is fairly normal. So from the chest x ray, ECG, and the blood investigation result, I think we can further define our diagnosis, right? Okay. So I think here the most uh, prominent that can pop up in our mind is the pericardial diffusion still, uh, but it's likely secondary to the neoplasm. 
the pneumonia is there and the left lung infection may be due to the pneumonia and there's a acute on CKD. So initially, the treatment is to put on face mask, monitor a patient, and if she's getting worse, there may be a rose to tap, right? Uh, because our topic today is to decide to tap or not to tap, right? But from obviously, from the initial presentation, the patient is still okay. Uh, so that's why KIV first, uh, and patient was started on antibiotic. However, towards the moment, the patient actually was sent. Uh, she complained of difficulty in breathing, and that's why the patient was up to the red zone. And you can see that the blood pressure is starting to drop from the initial one. patient tachycardic and become more tachymic. Patient not so hypothetic anyway, still maintaining over face mask. And this time, if you notice from the previous scan, the pericardial infusion is still there, but it's causing actually collapse of the right side of the heart. Not only right action, right when you at that point of time, you can left action. So at that point of time, emergency team is thinking that's a cardiac pneumonia because causing a subtle shock. So that's why I decided to cut. And there's actually a total of 150 cc hemorrhagic pericardial fluid, mm. which is quite frightening because it can be right not cutting from the pericardial fluid, but it's actually cutting from some vessels or even from the heart chamber itself. At this point, I think we can think of the possible complications. So, anyway, this procedure, patient still survive. They become less tachymic, still saturating under face mask, not requiring higher oxygen supplement, and the repeated ultrasound backside, the normal collapse, seems to be Cutting from the right place, uh, but we carry on, okay? The pericardial infusion has reduced. And from the cardiac monitor, the, the space on this pericardial, but less pericardial. And if you remember, that's how the ECG actually showing a rate of 120. So now the rate has come down a bit, but still semi-30. The no epileptic bit was seen during cutting from the procedure. And even for me, person was admitted to CCU under face mask. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chai, for your interesting case presentation. Now that we have received, uh, we know that we have received an elderly patient who has multiple comorbids. She was initially presented with pericardial effusion, which later progressed into cardiac tamponade. Now we have heard much about traumatic cause of cardiac tamponade. What about the medical cause of pericardial effusion? And when do we say it's cardiac tamponade? Which needed urgent intervention? So let's now invite Dr. Hamad Hamdi Chehasan. He is a man of distinction and an idol of knowledge. He is the head of cardiology unit. He has been involved in many trials and publications and has more than 20 years experience in medical and cardiology field. Let's welcome Dr. Hamad. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairperson. So, um, yeah, the, <coughs> there are a few clinical things that we can see from the um, <coughs> uh, clinical case presentation just now. So, there are a few clinical signs that uh, show the patient is quite unstable. So, we can see that, uh, the, first of all, is the uh, patient is uh, tachymnic and tachycardic. And patient has the um, uh, muscle heart sound as well. Okay, so technique, tachycardic, uh, muscle heart sound. So not sure whether uh, you you appreciate the JVP at that time. The JVP. So maybe that's another sign. And we can see from the uh, chest X-ray there, there is a <coughs> globular heart. Yeah, it's a uh, Cardiomegaly, but uh, there is also uh, the lung lung fields is look uh, hazy, so it means that it could be from the um, uh, APO, like it from the edema, or it can be from the pneumonia itself. Okay. So, but we need to decide when the patient deteriorates, uh, whether it's due to the lungs or whether this is mainly from the Itself. And uh, usually, 
when you tap the patient, regardless of the technique, uh, when you say it's a four centimeter or five centimeter or anything uh, like that, uh, the amount of the uh, fluid taken out when you, after you tap usually have to be five hundred mil or more. So if you tap and then the suddenly it's come out about hundred mil only. So maybe it's either your technique or your assessment from the initial assessment is not uh, entirely right. Okay. So pericardial um, efficient itself. All right. So this is a still image. Uh, we can appreciate that um, here. So what I like uh, when you we are dealing with the pericardial efficient or tamponade. So if the, there is a huge pericardial efficient, it becomes a tamponade. So the only scenario that you will do the pericardial synthesis is when you anticipate or the patient already in the tamponade, meaning that uh, nearly shock. Okay. So this one. Uh, we take the picture is the from the subcostal view. Okay. The one thing I like about the subcostal view is uh, that is the almost the safest place to go, even though the reported case of the liver laceration can happen, uh, even with the guiding of the uh, echocardiogram. Uh, we still can get the liver laceration, but if we uh, look at the anatomy, so at the ZC sternum, so, so this is area about the ZC sternum. So if you uh, puncture at the uh, left, uh, I mean right side of the yourself, meaning the left side of the patient, so one centimeter to the lateral side to the patient uh, at the ZC sternum. And then you go uh, to your needle, touch the rib cage, and then you run the needle below the rib cage towards the tips of the left shoulder. Okay, and the patient is lying about 30 degree angle. So there is no more space that you can think of at that time, meaning that you will not find any major uh, structure. Uh, other than pericardial uh, space, All right. so that's why I like when when I see the when I when someone refer with the pericardial efficient, I want to see the subcostal image. So you really need about two centimeter window here for your safety margin, meaning that if you put the needle in, alright, especially when the heart is dancing. So, when the heart is dancing, that is where you will see the voltage alternate. You can see from the ECG just now, there is some width, uh, width of the TRS bigger than the other. So, when the uh, heart is dancing in the pericardial efficient or tamponade, so the uh, the concept is similar to the uh, Doppler concept, which is uh, but blue away, red towards. Uh, in this case, for the uh, ECG wave, uh, uh, positive reflection when the wave travel towards the probe, and negative reflection uh, when it's run away from the probe. In this case, the uh, Public, uh, okay, the ECG is there when the heart is dancing toward the uh, uh, surface, then QRS is wider, it's when it's taller. Okay, when it goes away from the surface, then it's become shorter. So, when it bends in certain rhythm, that's why it's created the uh, uh, voltage alternate. Right. So this pericardial efficient also will limit the amount of the voltage goes into the probe. That is why you have the low voltage criteria as being presented by the first presenter. So you have a full time on the ECG itself 
uh, before we go to the echo. So there will be a tachycardic, low voltage criteria, and voltage alternate. So these three uh, answers will give you full marks if you are answering the short essay question or, or uh, what call it, uh, uh, any kind of a question, especially the uh, uh, data, the question, or anything to do with the part one or part two of the uh, MET, and maybe similar to your exam as well. So, uh, when the question has the pericardial uh, efficient, if we do the M mode, M mode is like a 1D technology. The 1D technology was developed uh, before the deploy. So, it's like M mode going towards the structure and it gives you a positive or negative diffraction. Alright? So, this one. Okay, this is pericardial space. So, this is pericardial space here. It's a 1D image of the M mode. Alright? So, during the bystander, so you can see the sector here is enlarging, meaning that it's quite big. And it's because it's rusted. But, the RV is collapsing. So, suppose RV here is also big. The same big as here, you know, that is open up. So, this one is uh, one of the techniques to see the uh, RV collapse uh, during the echo assessment. All right, so when we see that pericardial efficient, uh, we want to assess whether it's a uh, uh, patient has tamponade or impending tamponade. Uh, so that we can anticipate whether the patient will collapse or not. Right? So one of the uh, clinical assessment we call it uh, POTS trial, uh, where we have hypotension, which is this patient has, a muscle heart sound, and there is the elevated JVP. Okay, and there is also a present of the process products, which is uh, uh, different of the uh, pulse pressure. Uh, with the respiration of more than 12 millimeter mercury. And as I said, the uh, heart is dancing uh, or drowning inside the pericardial space, or in other words, we call it water bottle heart. You know, the heart inside the water itself. Right? So, tamponade is the clinical diagnosis and in the echocardiogram, when there is a collapse where the low exposure at the chambers during diastole is pushing down this pressure inside the myocardium uh, RV is pushing down by the pressure of the fluid inside the pericardial space. So this is the uh, 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 RV collapse. And the only treatment for this uh, is taking out the pericardial fluid. Right. This time, you have to do quick and properly. So, what the uh, time? Oh, the image is All right, good. So, this is the typical view. All right, in this case, uh, the point is here, but you still see the heart is dancing. This is give you the uh, voltage alternate. All right, in this case, uh, you still can do the top thing at the apical area here. That's quite big. You can see if this is one centimeter, uh, so it, it will go to one, two, three, four, nearly five centimeter of window. So you can put the needle at the apical area with the head of the echocardiogram. But normally, I will go back to the peric, uh, what can it, um, Subcostal view because uh, by putting the needle there and then you do the cell danger technique to put the proper catheter, J tips uh, catheter or tail catheter, then you can drain out almost all of the pericardial fluid. Okay. 
And uh, this is one of the example of the walk push alternator. Uh, so the heart is tensing when it goes towards the probe. The height of the jaw is complex. Heart width is taller when the heart is dancing away from the uh, uh, the, the uh, surface of the uh, pericardium. Okay. So as I mentioned, the person will have tachycardia and low voltage, and there is a voltage alternant in the ECG. So, so I think uh, when you want to get the pressure, I know the equipment in the EB is going to be different from the equipment from the CCU. Uh, I will say that uh, we are in the same hospital and uh, like, by asking the cardio people to talk, uh, the cardiologist on call to talk, uh, we can bring down the proper set of the uh, uh, pericardial tapping set there. Uh, so, it gives you a better management, meaning that if you tap by <coughs> uh, the te needle technique or uh, angio needle there, you sometimes uh, overshoot to the surface of the uh, myocardium and can injure the, uh, all the pericardial artery, uh, coronary artery. So, even with our own experience, uh, we uh, we have a two centimeter margin. We still experience the laceration to the small artery, such as a PDA. Uh, we experienced that before. So maybe the wire or the tips of the needle there, when the heart is dancing, is touching the tips of the uh, hardest face there of the needle, and it causes the laceration. So in this case. Of course, we have uh, no other people to uh, lose with our cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, so they have to do the uh, open up uh, uh, stenotomy and uh, uh, seal off all the laceration, uh, uh, tie up the artery there, and uh, put a proper drain, and then close up the chest. So. This in the case of the uh, some laceration. The technique also the the when we put, put the needle, sometimes it goes through and through to the uh, 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 IV chambers or RV chambers. So it can happen as well. That's why one of the techniques to do the uh, uh, pericardial tapping is by using the fluoro and the CM. So when we sub-danger the needle uh, to the wire before we sub-danger to the uh, catheter, pigtail catheter, we see the uh, where is the wire twirling. So if is is that twirling inside the uh, LV or RV chambers, or is twirling outside the uh, heart itself? So that's the uh, how you will de deal with the Proper technique to deal with the uh, tamponan or huge pericardial effusion. So maybe I will stop here first and uh, let the others maybe questions later on, or uh, let the other presenter give some uh, the presentation first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamad, for your very interesting presentation. So now let's see what's the progression of patient in what. May I proceed, Dr. Chai? Okay, so I continue. So, patient was admitted uh, to Chai, this. Can uh, you please turn on the presentation mode? Turn off the presentation mode. The, the slide show, mode. yeah. Oh, slide show. Yeah. Wait. Okay, so patient was admitted to CCU. So, as we see there on the third day, 29, from 27 to 29. Patients started to become tachycardic again. Patients still tachycardic, uh, but not hypotensive yet. So, in view of that, 
so a repeated transaction was done and it shows left field infusion. And in fact, the left field infusion is more compared to the patient on initial presentation. And backside ultrasound scan was done. There's infusion up to the left lower zone and causing collapse of the lung. And there's pendon sign. Basically, pendon sign is an ultrasound finding where you can see the floating debris inside the um, pillow infusion. It's basically trailing or moving with your respiration or cardiac pulsation. Pendon sign. So this is the post pericardial synthesis chest x ray. And if you compare to this one, it seems to be worsened. And the worsening part is the left to refusion. And of course, by looking at this, it's quite recommended because whether there's any first of all vessel injury, any two and two function, that causing is a hemorrhagic to refusion in other words. So we continue. So the echo was done on the time is seven, the systolic function is still okay. The rest of the be normal, but there's a hematoma noted at the apical region. The thickness around 1.1 cm. There's only minimal pericardial infusion, and no RV collects to suggest tendonic. But there's significant left pericardial infusion. And by ultrasound, we cannot differentiate whether it's just fit or it's blood. So that's why CT and Jogon Torres was done and noted massive left field infusion causing the destinal shift to the right. But there's no evidence of active bleed. There's only minimal telecardial infusion. But anyway, the team was referred, for the team was referred to the cardiothoracic team for possible traumatic procedure tapping. Thank you, Dr. Tsai. Clearly, the patient has suffered complications from the procedure. So what do we do now? Are we in trouble? Fear not. Let's not invite Mr. Muhammad Ishamuddin bin Ismail, the renowned cardiothoracic surgeon, who is also the head of the Heart and Lung Center, HCTM, and head of cardiothoracic surgery in HCTM. He will share with us the approach for pericardial synthesis and the possible complication of pericardial synthesis. The floor is yours, Mr. Hisham. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let us start with this. Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Uh, right, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, the topic has been given to me is the approach of pericardial synthesis and possible complications of pericardial synthesis and what do we do after that. Um, is this con it is the um, um, it is about the same as uh, the presentation, early presentation by uh, Dr. Hamad. And, uh, right. Okay. Um, as I mean, some instruction. Um, the pericardial synthesis uh, described in 1653 uh, to relieve fluids surrounding the heart is a blind approach where there's a lot of complications, about 20% exceeding. 20% of um, life shattering complications, the mortality approaching, uh, approaching 6%. So in 1970s, uh, many of us are using ultrasound techniques, which is now a standard practice. Outpatient, they can, can be done outpatient uh, settings uh, in stable patients, the right to in all groups, including children, and can be performed quickly in unstable patients to relieve the kind of deponent as this, uh, this case. Right? Um, there is a significant uh, pericardial infusion. The echocardial uh, pericardial synthesis has high success rate of more than 95 percent, and with the model, more morbidity and mortality rate is about one to three percent only. Right. So this is a case of uh, morbidity uh, for pericardial synthesis. So um, let's start with the approach. I think uh, Dr. Ahmad has uh, mentioned about the indications. And also, let's see the contraindication. The contraindication basically aortic dissection, post infarct myocardial rupture, and traumatic effusion with hemodynamic instability. So these are the the the, uh, the contraindication. Why? Because it warrants immediate surgical corrections like aortic dissection, myocardial rupture, and also traumatic effusion. So we can do uh, pericardial synthesis as a temporary measures to the event that patient decompensated and going around to the operating room. 
So other relative contraindications they are an corrected focal therapy, on active anti focal therapy or thrombocytopenia. So what's the approach? I think most of it, um, Dr. Hamad has said, it approach uh, generally because of the uh, towards the last collection of fluid in the pericardium and um, interestingly, in post cardiac surgery, especially in valve surgery, from patients from warfarin, there will be a lot of hemorrhagic polarization and there will be a lot of rocules inside the pericardium. So mainly it's at the inferior or the lateral side. So we can direct, directly target where is the large collection is. A few, a few, a few techniques. Number one is pleuroscopic cardiac uh, techniques. This is basically performed in a heart catheterization lab, and we just infuse by a standard technique uh, the fluorescent fluor 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 fluid inside the pericardium, confirm inside the pericardium, and we just put the J wire and also the catheter in. This is essential to check the gut wire position and these two angiographic projections. This is by fluoroscopy guided techniques. We can do also by CT guided techniques, but with the advantage of uh, very useful for poor outside sound window, especially so in very difficult, uh, uh, very bad outside sound window or outside sound or echocardiogram uh, machine. We have a very old machine. As I say, we have to pull down and up uh, the machine. So, uh, very useful for, for city guided. If uh, there is poor ultrasound window, can show local efficiency very effectively, allowing, allowing identification of best entry site, measure the density of pericardial effusion, and assess entry, and can assess entire stress to detect associated abnormalities. But in city guided, there is radiation exposure not widely available and logistically feasible and time consuming. And we have, um, we have had very um, IR uh, to help us most of uh, um, the facilities in, in, in Malaysia don't have, don't have CT scan but don't have IR to do it. So in the best way, especially in emergency, will be the echo guidance or ultrasound guidance. Right, the approach, the three approach actually, the um, most of it will be sub xiphoid, which is the the safest approach in emergency without access of ultrasound. Well, as I said before, without uh, without the access of ultrasound, doing a xiphoid blind, the mobility can go up to twenty percent. If not, if not, mortality can up to six percent. Uh, we can have um, approach of parasternal and also apical, but with the risk of pneumothorax and also bleeding. So most of us using a sub -sifon. So let's say about the complications. Mainly the complications we can can um, categorize into major complications, some minor complications. The mi major complications include mortality, cardiac arrest, pericardial perfusion leading to tamponade, um, pericardial uh, epicardial thrombus, uh, cardiac chamber laceration requiring surgery. Injury the intercostal vessel, pneumothorax requiring chest tube replacement, ventricular tachycardia, pulmonary edema, and local uh, system infection. So, uh, according to, to this patient, patient has a very large amount of uh, pneumo, uh, sorry, uh, pulmonary fusion, so hemothorax on the left side. So, other minor complications like small pneumothorax, vasovector response, transient hypotension, uh, non sustained super SVT, pericardial occlusion, and supercardial histolas. The mortality, as I said before, is after some guided, is lower, less than 1%, but overall the complications rate is about 4 to 30%. So this is gone into the uh, overall complications. Uh, this is uh, just uh, to give uh, the uh, logarithm of sorry, uh, the alphabetical order for the possible complications. Now, uh, I want to have two things in, in, in this uh, in this complication. So number one is the cardiac perfusion laceration or atrogenic atrogenic tamponade. We like to clear off tamponade, but we end up uh, perforate the cardiac. We have the laceration also atrogenic tamponade the the event. So cardiac perfusion rate is about one to three percent of all complications, 
And the reading, the reading presentation time was about five hours. So if you start, I'll give it, uh, start doing um, precardial synthesis, we have to observe six to 24 hours. So sometimes uh, a bit uh, difficult to, to see all this uh, area to the uh, temple adding. Several findings suggest in precardial tremors, which is the failure of symptoms improve. Failure of symptoms improvement following therapeutic, uh, therapeutic uh, pericardial synthesis, detection of new homogeneous immobile mass attached to the epicardium with extension to the peripheral pericardium, a new presence echo density uh, on 2D. For this person, we have a uh, hematoma, right? Hematoma about 1.1 centimeters. So this is, this is post uh, pericardial synthesis. So probably, probably there's uh, some some um, laceration uh, to the myocardium. Luckily, yeah, this person has uh, no uh, uh, hemodynamic instability and he is stable otherwise. Right. So, the management of management of particle uh, fluid collection, we can do left thoracotomy, we can do sub support approach. As I said before, uh, post cardiac surgery, especially in valve surgery, when patients don't walk free, there will be a lot of pericardial effusion and locally the pericardial effusion. So this is one, uh, this is two of the approaches um, to do uh, to, to clear off the fluid in the pericardium. One is left by thoracotomy when there is a lot of fluid on the left side of the heart and sub for approach when there's a lot of fluid in the inferior part of the heart. Um, when there is um, when there is the pericardial effusion which is instability uh, hemodynamically, so we have to do noble heart and stomatomy to find out where is the uh, bleeding from. Okay, we can do, if the patient is stable enough uh, to do right vest pericardial window, especially in chronic pericardial, uh, pericardial efficiency, we can, yes, we can do that. Or straight away we do for corrective surgery, such as in aortic dissection, traumatic myocardial injury, rupture, unstable in, un in unstable hemodynamics. So the complications uh, for pericardial synthesis in any surgical management. Yes, we can do this conservative. It is small, tremors, hematoma, as, it, as like this patient is uh, very stable and uh, repeated echo. There is no uh, um, pericardial uh, effusion anymore, but it is really small, uh, hematoma at the apex. So we do can, can do conservative surgery or we can still really do surgical correction. Uh, or stenotomy. If, if there is a myocardial perforation or injury, or, or like Dr. Hamad said, if there is a coronary artery injury, which is wrong, but it can occur. Uh, other injuries, uh, liver injuries, it can be a conservative or large amount of hematoma. We have to do a laparotomy, a bowel injury, uh, we have to do a bowel repair, lung injury. Um, like this person, we have a large amount of uh, fluid, we put in the catheter. Uh, but if there's continuously bleeding, you have to do a thoracotomy and proceed what is the cause of the bleeding. And of course, there's a large vessel injury and stenotomy, and we have to proceed with thoracotomy as well. So these are the things that uh, we can do uh, in surgical management for complications of pericardial synthesis. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Isham, for your very insightful presentation. Mm. Mm, okay. So subsequently, patient was transferred to the, this is a progression, patient was transferred to the general medical ward from CCU. And uh, as noted, the repeated chest X-ray showing worsening of the left perifusion and subsequently chest tube was inserted to drain the fluid. So this is the chest X-ray before chest tube insertion and this is the one after chest tube insertion. Okay, it's improving. So uh, another repeated echo was done on the 31st and there's resolved hematoma, minimal pericardial effusion, no obvious clot, and no left effusion was seen after drainage. 
for another city forest was done. Uh, the total inflation also is resolving, but the slight worsening of pericardial inflation. Anyway, patient is stable, hemodynamically. And subsequently, patient was comfortable, able to wean off oxygen, and was discharged well around one week later. Thank you. Okay, so now, from this case, we have all witnessed the importance of echocardiography. So now let's sit back and enjoy Dr. Bear Boon Chong's pre-recorded slide on echocardiography in cardiac tamponade. topic given to me is about the echocardiographic features of the cardiac component. As we know, pericardium is made of double layer of strong fiber structures covering the heart. You have a fibrous layer and also the serous layer. And uh, in between the two layers, there is a space which physiologically is approximately 50 cc of pericardial fluid. As the pressure of additional fluid in this space may lead to compression of the heart, causing diffusion and tamponade. When the pericardial compliance cannot increase further with the increment of the pericardial effusions, there will be an equalization of the intra pericardial pressures, so which leads to uh, patient developed symptoms such as dyspnea. When you examine the patient, there will be an elevated jugular venous pressure. The patient may be hypotensive, tachycardia, and causes paradoxes. In order to diagnose cardiac tamponade, you need to fulfill some certain criteria. Cardiac tamponade should be suspected in patients presented with hypotension, raised JVP, causes paradoxes, tachycardia or tachypnea, with severe dyspnea. Additional signs may include no device voltage in the ECG and the presence of uh, electrical alternates with uh, a large cardiac sinuate on the chest X-ray. In the imaging, echocardiography is the diagnostic method of choice in suspected cardiac tamponade and should be carried out without delay. CT and cardiac MRI are not part of the routine evaluations of patients with suspected cardiac tamponade. They are useful to rule out concomitant disease which involving the mediastinal in patients with large pericardial infusions, for example, those patients with malignancy or aortic dissection. Whenever we think of cardiac tamponade, we must have a differential diagnosis, so which includes constrictive pericarditis, congestive heart failure, and advanced liver disease with cirrhosis, which can present with the similar sign and symptoms. As you can see from the illustration of the pictures, so if you look at the chest X-ray, the heart is hugely dilated. The huge cardiomegaly may represent water water sign on the chest X-ray. If you look at the ECG, there will be electrical evidence, which the ECG there will be a tall QRS followed by short QRS and alternate subsequent cycles. As you can see from the echocardiography, there will be presence of the fluid accumulate in the pericardial space. You can be seen in various fields which can help to diagnose the pericardial effusion. This is the proposed scoring system to decide whether patient need urgent drainage or we can delay the pericardial tapping. There are various scores in each of the steps, if the patient fulfills the score of at least more than six, which indicates urgent pericardial synthesis in the absence of indications. Urgent, urgent surgical treatment for cardiac amnesia is recommended regardless of the score if the patient presented with tapping diabetic dissection, ventricular pre war rupture after the actual MI, or severe recent chest trauma or iatrogenic chemopericardium when the bleeding cannot be controlled percutaneously. These are a very good algorithm to help you to decide, especially when the patient presented 
in the middle of the line. As you can see from here, the current component uh, depends on the rate of the rise of the effusion and the rate under compliance, not necessarily the effusion size. So as you can see, if it's in the acute conditions, the acute uh, accumulations of the pericardial fluid can cause the intrapericardial pressure to increase uh, significantly without a um, significant amount of the effusion size. As opposed to those patients with chronic presentation, the accumulation is very slow. So the, the pericardial component is much better compared to those with uh, acute. So uh, even though the patient has a large pericardial effusion, they may not in tamponade. When the intra-pericardial pressure is more than the intracardial pressure, that may cause the collapse of the right heart as the right heart is a low pressure system compared to the left heart. So there are two collapses uh, that can be seen in uh, RA and also RB. RA is the earliest chamber to be collapsed. Uh, earliest sign of the tamponade. The so, sensitivity is about 50 to 100 percent. As for the diastolic RV collapse, uh, it's about 75 to 90 percent. When we do echo, our analysis is the first view that we use. In this view, there are various structures uh, that can be seen. Uh, in order to decide whether it's a pool or pericardial effusion, Descending aorta would be a good landmark if you are not very familiar with the anatomical structures. As you can see from here, the pericardial infusions uh, happen uh, in front of the descending aorta, and the full infusion will be posterior to the uh, descending aorta. So, descending aorta will be a good landmark if you are not very familiar with the uh, structures uh, in the echo. So, uh, always use this uh, to decide whether you are dealing with uh, pericardial effusion or pleural effusion. As you can see from these pictures, the descending alpha is here. When there's the fluid in front of the descending alpha, this is pericardial in origin. But it's behind the descending alpha is pleural effusion. This is a parasolar long axis and short axis view. As you can see, when you are doing in the long axis view, the fluid is accumulated in front of the descending alpha. So this is definitely is a pericardial effusion. And on the short axis view, also you can see clearer. This is a posteriorly more localized than the anterior. In the apical view, you will see the fluid much more in the anterior and also anterior. Uh, region and for the subcoastal view, you will see much more clearer the fluid is accumulated much more in the RV and also the RA. So, the systolic uh, RA collapse is the earliest echocardiographic sign of the tamponade. Uh, sometimes, uh, in emergency, difficult to decide when is the systolic and diastolic because we are not attaching the ECG during the echo. So, but for the eye volume, you can see here, there is uh, some form of collapse. So, in order to help you to decide, so you can use the walk as a guide. So, when the walk is closed, it's in systole. So, this systole is followed the ventricular systole. So, when there is a ventricular systole, so the walk is closed. So, you can see that the RA is actually moving inwards. So, this is the RA collapse. So, this is the earliest sign of when the intrapericardial pressure is increasing further, so the RV will be start to collapse. So usually RV collapse in the diastolic phase. So to decide if you don't have an ECG, you can use the walk as a uh, guidance. So when the ventral walk is open, so meaning this is in the ventricular diastolic phase. So uh, you can see that the RV is actually moving inwards. So this is RV diastolic collapse. If you do a mode, you can see much more clearer that this is the RV collapse. 
this is another example to show that this uh, RV collapse if the impulsion is significant. As in these uh, pictures, there is two forms of impulsion, pericardial and also pleural impulsion. In the sub view, you also can see that the RV is collapsed uh, in this view. So uh, these are the clues to tell you that the patient is in cardiac tamponade. Another feature is the IVC. So when the patient is in a significant amount of pericardial effusion, which uh, causing the tamponade, you can see that the uh, IVC is uh, much dilated with the hepatic vein hole also will be shown to be dilated. Sometimes you need uh, extra signs to help you in terms of uh, diagnosis of uh, cardiac tamponade. So the mitral and also tricuspid inflow velocity can be used to assess. So if you pulse wave at the mitral inflow view, you, you're going to get difference in the variations if the patient is in tamponade. So during expiration and inspiration, the change in the velocity if it's more than 25% in the mitral inflow view, so this is significant. And as for the tracker speed, if it's more than 40% change in the velocities, so these are considered significant uh, uh, signs to suggest pericardial effusion. However, uh, this is not pathognomonic uh, as this uh, can be seen in constrictive pericarditis as well. These are the examples to show you that the uh, diagram B and diagram C, the change in the uh, respiratory variations whenever the when you do the RV inflow and also the tricuspid inflow velocities. So for mitral is more than 25% change, for tricuspid is more than 40% change to consider to be significant. So that, that's the size of the size of the effusion matters. Uh, the answer can be yes or no. It depends on the clinical scenario. If the patient presents uh, acutely, even a small pericardial effusion is significant for the patient. However, if we don't have much information about the patient condition, so if you patient presented with uh, the and symptoms suggestive of uh, pericardial effusions or tamponade. So always have to correlate with the clinical scenario. So doesn't mean that when you have uh, more than 20 mm of uh, pericardial effusions is equals to uh, tamponade. Always have to look at the patient as a whole. Sometimes the patient may have a significant uh, pericardial effusions which they are not in tamponade. So you have to assess the whole scenario. As I mentioned earlier, so you need to have a clinical analysis, imaging, and also differential analysis to help you to decide whether this is a significant diffusion that requires tapping or you can wait. Okay, in summary of the echocardiography features, you can have a RA or RV collapse, and then you have your pictorial IVC, and then you can have a uh, mitral inflow or CT variation based on the respiration. If it's more than 25 for mitral, more than 40 for tricuspid. Back to our case, uh, this patient had a pericardial tapping done in emergency department as uh, hemodynamic was compromised uh, at that time while in ED. So I don't have the echo video done by the ED team as it was not safe at that time. So, uh, after the patient was admitted to uh, CCU, we have done the uh, bedside echo uh, and there is only minimal uh, pericardial effusion uh, present as the drainage has been already done. However, you can see from here, there is presence of a uh, poor effusion. I have got a schematic diagram on the right hand side. The blue color signifies the uh, Effusions and the green color is the uh, pericardium, and there is another layer that is near to the apex. This is 
uh, Thomas Thomas is part of the complications that uh, are seen after the pericardium uh, happens. From the uh, initial documentation and also the x-ray, patient doesn't have uh, poor effusion uh, initially. Uh, this is uh, occur after the uh, tapping. Probably during the tapping, the needle may have uh, made the communication between the two uh, and also the pericardium uh, during the procedure that may be causing the drainage of the pericardium inside uh, into the uh, pleural cavity as well. Uh, if you scan more, much more left side, you can see that there is a significant amount of the pleural uh, fluid presence with the part of the lungs is actually collapsed. This is uh, what we call as a fox tail sign if you do uh, a bedside scan for the lungs. So uh, we have converted the patient from the pericardial effusion to pleural uh, effusion. Because of the significant amount of uh, pleural effusion presence, so, uh, medical team have done the chest tube insertion for these patients. So, after the chest tube insertion, we have repeated another echo. As you can see from here, actually, the amount of uh, pericardial effusion is actually very, very minimal. Uh, the plural free is minimal as well after the uh, drainage of the uh, by the chest tube. As you can see from all the view. Uh, the pericardial effusion is only mini uh, minimal and, uh, and there is no more uh, uh, hematoma as what we saw initially when it was first admitted to uh, CCU. In terms of uh, echocardiographic findings, uh, sometimes they are not 100%, so uh, there may be false negative or false positive that uh, when we see the image, we think that this is patient is in tamponet, but then uh, the whole thing that's an arrow may, uh, uh, may be different. So the most common false positive uh, echo determinants of the tamponet is the RA and RB collapse. Some patients, they may be hypovolemia. So the RA and RB may be collapsed in these uh, conditions. So we have to be careful when we want to decide on the uh, tapping in uh, this group of patients. Uh, another point is the large pleural effusion, which can cause the increase in the intrapericardial pressure, which may limit the cardiac component. So we should drain the pleural effusion before we decide whether this patient is in tamponade for the heart. And some patients with uh, high right side pressure, such as those with uh, common hypertension, common embolism, or uh, RV volume overload, cardiac tamponade will not straight RA and RB collapse because uh, the increase in the pericardial pressure that does not equalize the RB and RA pressure because the right side chambers uh, pressure is already high so the intra uh, pericardial pressure unable to overcome that pressure so if patient may not be uh, show the sign of a tamponade. Uh, another uh, scenario will be those patients uh, with intubation uh, ventilated with a high peak, you won't have a, a collapse of the RA and RB because of the pressure by the ventilator. So, all these things need to be taken into account. Uh, that's why the whole scenario of the uh, patient presentation is important to decide whether this patient is temporary or uh, just a diffusion. In summary, uh, clinical. Uh, diagnosis of cardiac tamponade is uh, depending on the patient presentation, the patient's signs, and also the symptoms that presented. So, in terms of ECG, you can see there is an electrical alternance. In the chest x ray, classically, you can see a huge globular cardiomegaly, which uh, shows to have a water bottle sign. Uh, however, uh, in the small paper that we won't have this uh, huge cardiomegaly or those presented with acute uh, paper that you also you can't appreciate this sign. 
in terms of uh, echocardiography, there are various views that can help you to uh, know where is the location of the effusions and the landmark for the descending aorta is a good landmark to help you to decide whether this is a plural or pericardial effusions. And when the two features of a tamponet uh, in the echo, you need a uh, various view to decide. And uh, IVC uh, rhetoric is a good sign as well, and as well as uh, tracker speed and also mitral inflow velocity. This will be a good sign to decide whether the patient is in the time or not. Thank you everyone for your kind attention. If you have any question, you can email me for further clarifications. Before I forget, uh, if you ever plan to do pericardial tapping, please do save the video or can ask your friends to save the video while you're doing the procedure. So that we can have a discussion after the procedure or for the clarification. Thank you. Last but not least, let's welcome Dr. Muhammad Isaac Arslan, our new up and rising radiologist and lecturer from Radiology Department. His presentation is on radiological finding in cardiac tamponade and possible cause of pure effusion in this case. The floor is yours, Dr. Isaac. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning to everyone. So, I think most of my uh, images that I will share with you is already been presented by most of our cardiologists and also the cardiac surgeon. Um, so, from our point of uh, our point of view from the radiological side uh, in cardiac tamponade and uh, the things that what we should look for. Okay, so. From this chest radiograph, um, based on the clinical symptoms, would you come into your mind that this is a cardiac tamponade? Okay, first of all, we can see that the heart here is very huge. Okay, it has this globular shape or the water water shape as described by Dr. Bailey now. And you can see that um, the heart is. Um, basically, it has a higher density than compared to the normal one, which I shall put here and compared to a normal radiograph side by side. And you can see that the density of the heart here is slightly increased. And this can raise the suspicions of having a pericardial effusion. Otherwise, we don't see any uh, uh, blunting of the blunt, uh, cosophenic or the cosophenic uh, cardiophrenic angles. Um, the heart, uh, the lungs are fairly okay, there's not much of a consolidation uh, or any space opacities and the rest are uh, unremarkable. So this is uh, the subsequent chest x-ray was taken after the uh, pericardial synthesis and you can see that now it appears more white, especially on the left side. You can appreciate here there is a meniscus sign on the left blunting the left cosmophrenic angle. The right cardiophrenic angle also is cannot be seen. And now you can see that the right cardiophrenic angle is also blunted. And if you appreciate further, the trachea is already shifted towards the right side and there is more heart that is going towards the right side of the chest. And this means that this patient has a meristinal shift. So at this point of time, I believe um, they suspected uh, that this patient had a vascular injury and proceeded with a CTA uh, of the aorta. And how to detect that this is a CTA, you can see that most of the contrast is within the descending uh, thoracic aorta. Here you can see that there is minimal pericardial effusion. This is the pleural effusion and this is the opacified uh, collapsed right, uh, left lower lobe. On the right side, you can also appreciate there is um, a smaller plural efficient. And let's focus on the left plural efficient. You can see that it is huge, but there is no active contrast that extravasates from any of the important structures, especially the uh, descending thoracic aorta or the left uh, or, or any from the heart that enters to the plural cavity and causing increase. Uh, density of the pleural uh, efficient on the left side. 
this is the sagittal view just to show you that the uh, plural effusion it tracks up up to the uh, apical segment of the left upper loop and this is the collapsed left lower loop which is not fully collapsed this is a partial segmental collapse of the posterior basal segment and also the lateral segment of the left lower loop okay uh, on the um, long, uh, long view you can see here that this patient also developed a hemothorax there's a small uh, lucency or we can say that it, this is a hypodensity which is uh, appears at the anterior of the left chest wall and this is on the sagittal view which we can appreciate better and actually this is the supine uh, image so when the patient is in supine position all the air or the pneumothorax will go to the anterior aspect of the chest and it accumulates more on the anterior part and also at the lower side of the left uh, left uh, thoracic cavity okay uh, some other findings that we can see that there is uh, uh, sorry there is a subcutaneous infectious as well as a result from the uh, pericardial synthesis and this is uh, the chest x-ray uh, after uh, after the repeat uh, chest x-ray after the pericardial synthesis and this is the uh, chest x-ray after the chest tube insertion and you can see that there is already a uh, resolution of the uh, most of the left pleural effusion we can see still uh, see the blunting of the right cardiophrenic angle here which uh, indicates that there is some uh, small pleural effusion left and you can also appreciate that the trachea is already centered there is no um, uh, the heart is already back uh, at the center and it's not shifted longer to the right side. And this is the chest radiograph on the day that they find uh, the patient uh, after the removal of the chest tube. Okay, and then the patient underwent another CT uh, just to reassess uh, the whole condition of the patient. We can see that the pleural effusion has significantly less compared to the previous one. And there is residual um, collapse of the left uh, lower loop. You can see that there is worsening of the uh, pericardial effusion, especially on the right side. And you can see that surrounding this, the pericardium is slightly enhanced. And this is probably maybe secondary to the post um, procedural uh, changes or pericarditis which I assume this is would be more suggestive of uh, post uh, pleural. Uh, pleural post uh, procedural related uh, enhancement we do observe uh, this kind of uh, changes in other procedures as well especially in doing um, just uh, um, insertion of uh, uh, catheters uh, in the pleura uh, and so on okay uh, this is on the surgical view you can see that uh, there is residual uh, pericardial effusion and there is enhancement of the pericardium uh, on the long view, you can see that there is still residual collapse, the pleural effusion bilaterally, and we don't see any uh, consolidation of the lungs. There are a few segmental uh, atelectasis, and there are no other features to suggest that this patient has any um, uh, infective or features of uh, pulmonary edema. So, uh, how it happened, the post procedural pleural uh, effusion? So on um, our side, um, I think uh, when we see back retrospectively, what we can see here is that at, the, at this region, there is a, a, a discontinuity that, uh, that I would rather say uh, that this is actually most probably the site of the puncture where if we expect to see uh, an air in the pericardium, it should be at the entry in the independent region, but this is at the site where you can see it is also seen along with the um, uh, pneumothorax uh, region that we can see. And after the second CT scan, we see at the same region, at the same level, that this discontinuity is no longer uh, seen and probably is already sealed off. Okay, these are the pneumothorax also seen, which uh, suggests that the pleura layer was also uh, punctured. So, uh, pericardial pleural effusion is a communication between the pericardial and pleural. So, uh, in a rapid resolution of pericardial effusion and development of the immediate pleural effusion after pericardial synthesis, so uh, 
pick up the prayer of Fisula should be uh, considered because, because uh, from the high pressure fit within the peripheral space is close into the peripheral cavity in a rapid fashion. So this was a uh, case reported uh, here by Dr. Matthew. It is uh, in the advent of difficult peripheral synthesis, so evidence of significantly increased intraperiodic high pressure on acute periphery, uh, poor damage of peripheral effusion, and rapid resolution of peripheral effusion with the expected fluid aspirated. So, uh, in such radiograph, basically uh, imaging for cardiac component, there is no specific uh, or sensitive uh, imaging features to suggest what you can um, suspect when a patient having a cardiac component is the cardiomegaly with a global uh, shape or a pear shaped heart or the bottom water sign and the increased homogeneous opacity of the heart, okay, as we can see here. And in CT, uh, there are also features of cardiac tamponade. We can see the pericardial effusion, uh, pr uh, preferably will be a huge amount, bearing of the intervertical septum, pericardial thickening, right ventricular collapse, enlargement of the superior or inferior vena cava, hepatic and renal veins, and contrast reflux into this venous system. However, we do not see all any of these um, features in our city because the uh, pericardial effusion was already drained. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. That's so informative. I'm sure our audiences learned a lot from you. With this, our presentation has come to an end. We will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Is there any question from the floor? Yes. Any question? Um, Prof. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Well done to the uh, team presenting. Uh, Dr. Ote, my name, I, I was <laughs> ex-UKM cardio, now I'm just invited back as a visiting. <coughs> so, um, yes, uh, time for that, uh, we have a uh, very situation. I, I still remember uh, when I first started back in the UKM, back in 2005, with the Hawaiian cardiologist, so you can imagine our own call. So one day there was one guy, uh, um, physician, eh? Dr. Lu, you remember Dr. Lu, the nephro. <laughs> he called me, Dr. Gun, he's a confidant. Uh, 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 how do you know? I did echo. He's a physician, I did echo himself. Doesn't know, he said, um, so how? I, I cannot come, I'm too far away. So after a while he called me, he said, Doctor, I did it. Eh? He did the, <laughs> the, the, the confidant himself. And in fact, he did with, uh, was it using a um, you know, normal pigtail or was it using uh, one of these people women? I think you can use it. I did it. I did it. So when you run out of pericardio uh, synthesis, a kit, then you will be resorted to the normal. Uh, you know, this, when you do and you grab the pigtail, you can use that, but it's very, it's very hard. Or at one point, we used the uh, triple woman. I mean, it's not standard recommended. In fact, uh, you can get the pericardial synthesis kit, even if not available, hospitals should be able to order uh, within half an hour. But this is a more urgent emergency than to just can, can use it. But there must be a technique. So as I uh, just recommended in the video just now, one of the, for us cardiologists, one of the, uh, not common, but known scenario where the component happens is after PCI, after total intervention. Eh? Uh, patient had not gone, done angioplasty. So we got a few cases even in, in uh, when I was here in HKM. In fact, recently I had one uh, after doing a good number of uh, nearly four years of PCI in my own lab in Anur. So we had one patient who had chest pain, post um, PCI, and also a very uh, uh, BP during the procedure, then recovered. So we're wondering if it okay, just do echo. So of course he had. So we call it two component because there's no RV collapse, but because patient did lose blood pressure, so we decided to to uh, 
put the operator to synthesis. But in this case, it's kind of semi urgent, so we managed to get, we, we just ran out of the, uh, the, the kit, so we managed to get the kit from K to J within less than one hour. So we still <laughs> see what we sell. But as I said, uh, in this case, we cannot use the other method, we have to use the kit because when it is blood, the blood is very thick. I mean, you, you need to have the big uh, pigtail, which is the standard uh, pericardial security set. So this is one of the uh, causes of uh, temper and not listed in our <laughs> So remember, if patient post PCI, they collapse. Of course, some, uh, you have to suspect stent thrombosis, acute stent thrombosis. But another diagnosis, yes, do echo, and you might uh, diagnose this uh, uh, tamponade disease. Uh, thanks again uh, to the presenters. Um, you guys, uh, as, as, as we suggested just now, yes, do the video. If you have a case, maybe invite others from uh, uh, your team, you know, or your case, just invite the ED and others to share. Of course, it's uh, sometimes very nervous uh, because I myself, uh, the, the recent case I did, I haven't done for a long not very common in our know, setup, even the spontaneous uh, peri uh, pericardial epigen or tamponade. So it's good to have to share the case with other people so that uh, they can learn quickly. Okay, it's a useful skill even for the ED physician should know the procedure and maybe you have to do it one day. No, no cardiologist around then. But there's one around and should get the cardiologist up to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fati. Uh, and then technically the, when you quit the uh, university, the professor, you shouldn't use the professor, but I still call productive my professor. So, that's the thing. So, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the temperament is the uh, clinical uh, diagnosis. But, uh, I would say that the, uh, the, the technique, to use uh, uh, or to do, you, you have to first do no harm. Uh, that, that's, that's the key of what you, are, uh, you want to do. And then, um, there are of course a lot of the uh, explanation or uh, description, the technique. Okay. So what I know uh, from the discussion and from the experience, of course, subconscious view is one of the safest and easy to do. And ethical, and some people do the uh, at the uh, uh, angle of the second interposal space there at the right side, so they go deep and straight to the peripheral space. So, in this case, maybe the first intercostal space and uh, you do straight uh, to the uh, under, under ultrasound to the peripheral space. Yeah, unfortunately, there is sometimes the, there is lungs there. That you can inject and put in the uh, 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 pneumothorax. Uh, so that's uh, we try to avoid that. Uh, and also the, the time that, uh, for the discussion is very uh, minimum. Uh, so, uh, as Prof uh, mentioned, regarding the kids, so maybe in the ED we can save one or two kids for the uh, uh, temporal drain. Okay, so that's the safest one. So you put the needle, start the angel with the wire, and then put the bigger catheter, and then let it drain out. So first aspiration there, maybe we aim about 500 cc uh, until the BP cost level. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, uh, can, I, can I ask um, Dr. Ahmad or uh, uh, Prof. Fatih um, about in uh, uh, decompression syndrome, pericardial synthesis, decompression syndrome. There is an acute edema post, uh, post uh, pericardial synthesis of uh, pericardial tamponade. What is your thought about that? Yeah, because of the, when you drink out a lot of the fluid, so you can have relative hypotension itself, a uh, hypovolemic shock. So it's, uh, in, in that shape, uh, you do the, with the, <laughs> with your uh, alternate space, uh, as I this, so you have to replace with the uh, fluid. So in this case, maybe if you think that the 
uh, what call it the hypovolemic, then you have to replace with the uh, fluid IV plus there is a uh, anotropic support for the heart. Okay, so I think this is just relative for short while. Once the heart is continue, uh, in the good space, a uh, good uh, state after that, so patient will recover. So I don't think that you need to uh, rush uh, to do anything for that. So as long as you can see from the echo, the uh, RV start to expand, and then the amount of the uh, pericardial space getting shorter from let's say five centimeter to one centimeter, then uh, you can see the blood pressure start to pick up. So I think the the issue is not that much that we see in our uh, clinical practice here. Because in 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 acute in when I post uh, pericardial synthesis in paper lab. Uh, the pericardial synthesis of the compression syndrome is uh, because of the uh, abrupt um, increase in uh, stroke volume on the right side. So not only not not much on the left uh, ventricle. So there will be increased pressure to the to the um, uh, pulmonary pulmonary veins and pulmonary uh, arteries. So that's when patients have uh, some ed edema that really post uh, post uh, pericardial synthesis. But uh, there's very simply. Um, Management about this, about this. So, probably it's uh, self limited. Yes, yeah, I said the, when the uh, uh, diastolic function returns back to normal, so you can have uh, you know, the hemodynamically they are normalizing themselves. So, as I said, I I don't see that much for the uh, relative hypotension in the SIT drainage. Uh, the there may be you have to give uh, uh, some albumin and also uh, some fluid to recover the blood pressure. In, in same goes to the pleural effusion. But for the component, um, I don't see that much uh, from what I do in the uh, pericardial synthesis. Any questions? Because uh, I think the time is uh, really running out. It's uh, half past nine already. So the recipe team come here to support us very good. And yes, they also play a good part into the fluid efficient. So maybe we continue in our next uh, CME in this similar kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if, with this, um, we end our presentation for today. I would like to express my gratitude to all the presenters who have shared their knowledge and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 